I do feel like the Lord is going to pour out in a special way. If you need a healing in your body, I do believe that God is going to uh, op operate the gift of uh, faith, healings, and miracles in this place, um, but according to the Word of God. And so we're going to get through the Word of God, and we're going to see how God is going to do that. Amen? So Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, John is saying, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what you see write in a book, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And John says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. John had an encounter with God. He just had an encounter with God. And when he had in his hand, set right hand, seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Somebody say, at his feet. I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death, and has become the line of demarcation. He has the keys of hell and death. I want to speak to us on this subject, um, back to his feet, back to his feet. If you would want to put your Bible down, why don't you just lift your hands? Let's pray. I know that the presence of God is here, but let's, let's enter in. Let's uh, focus our hearts. Lord, we love you so much, Jesus. God, we're so thankful for your presence, oh God. Lord, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost tonight, Lord. Communicate your word to us tonight. Let us respond appropriately, Lord. I pray that the Holy Ghost would anoint our ears and our minds, God. Lord, I pray that you will pour out healings, God. I pray that you will pour out miracles accordingly. God, recorrect us, redirect us accordingly, Lord. Lord, that your will be done in the rest of this service. May we fall at your feet tonight, God. May we be in all of your presence tonight, Lord. In the name of Jesus, why don't you lift your hands and your voice one more time. Let's just give thanks and adoration to the Lord. God, we're nothing without you, Jesus. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. You know, it lives in almost infamy now. It's like an A.D. or a B.C. in our modern timeline. We tell stories based on it. We compare our actions before and after it. We remember how things used to be before it and how things are after it. We remember how things were a certain way and now how things are a certain way. We went into it with hope and faith and promise and expectation, but that waned with what was going to come. For some, they were blindsided. They didn't know what was happening and how to respond. For others, they felt something was coming but they couldn't identify it. And had we known what was coming, undoubtedly, we would have prepared ourselves. And had we known what kind of circumstances would arrive at our doorsteps, we would have definitely made the time to make sure we were ready. But it was, I believe, the plan of God to hide some of what was to come in order to reveal what was already here. And if you haven't put it together yet, I'm talking about the year of 2020. It was a year where God sent something to reveal what was already here. 
It said all the things that happened in 2020, it was just simply used as a means to reveal the things that were already here. And I'm not here to give you a recap of the year. I'm sure you're well acquainted. Um, and I'm not here to resurface wounds or, or trauma or pain or anything like that. But I do want to point out something. It was a year where this COVID thing gripped the whole world and initial lockdowns occurred and social unrest gripped our streets and high profile deaths occurred and political schemes unfolded and many unprecedented uh, climate events happened. And during this time, it was, it, it was the church that perhaps felt blindsided. But despite the unknown, the church was still the church, amen? There were still men and women of God praying and interceding. There were still people worshiping the Lord. There was still the word of God being preached. There was still Bible studies being taught despite the fact people were still receiving the Holy Ghost. People were still being baptized in Jesus' name. So despite all those things, the church was still the church, amen? The church was still on the move no matter what. But there was a vein in the spirit that was seemingly recurring as I would hear men and women of God speak what the Lord would be giving them, whether I would hear it online or whether I would talk to the prayer order warriors at our church or I would call some of my friends and they would just uh, uh, speak to me what they've been feeling in the spirit. It would be some of the same uh, words and, and, and in the same vein of the spirit, it would be different words oftentimes and illustrations, but a common theme. And it would be that I would hear these things like God has brought us to our knees and God has humbled us and God has allowed this so that we can depend on him. And it was during the lockdown where the excuse of not having enough time to pray and not having enough time to read the word and not having enough time to commit to the church, it was during the lockdown where that excuse was no longer valid. I said, during the lockdown, you didn't have an excuse to say, oh, I just, I have so much things going on. No, we was all in the same boat. Ain't none of us was going anywhere. <laughs> that excuse was no longer valid. And, and we had time to reevaluate some things in our life and a time to refocus our walk with God if we could. And it was as though we were at the mercies of God because so many things were happening and so many things were just coming in. It was as though we're just, just riding the wave, just like, Lord, I'm, I'm just here. Jesus just takes me wherever you want me to go. We were just at the mercies of God. It was like, it was like a, a Esther when she approached the king. She said, this is all dependent on the king just simply at the mercies of the king. And it was a raw dependence on his power. It was a raw dependence on the word of God. It was a raw dependence on prayer and fasting. We were shut up in homes and churches for so long, and we were all just trying to figure it out. But then the lockdown started lifting. The gatherings started happening again. Services began commencing, and that normal living uh, started springing up its head again, and pretty soon we're in 2021, and uh, it, we kind of still feel the lingering effects of 2020. And in fact, I would dare say 2021 was just a, a, a lighter version of 2020. It still had these effects from 2020 still happening, but but it it, it wasn't as hard. The, the sting wasn't as present, but. Uh, the church kept marching on. I still was seeing people being baptized in Jesus' name, and we were still seeing miracle signs and wonders, and we were still seeing people gather together in church services, and the restrictions began to fall, and, and we were making adjustments for our people at whatever local assembly we were at. We were just, just thankful to be together again, and we were just able to go and minister and do the work of God like we used to, and there were some setbacks for sure, no doubtably, but, but it wasn't like 2020, amen? We were back up and moving. We were on the move, and nothing was going to stop us, and in fact, if anything tried to stop us, we were going to go ahead and just plow right through that, praise God, and we were going to buck against that, and in 2022, it's like night and day. <laughs> Did it have its issues? Absolutely, but it was like night and day. The sting from 2020 wasn't there. But here we are in 2023, and I know 
I'm just setting us up. We're just on a runway. Praise God. And we're in 2023, and we are, we're ready more than ever, y'all. I, I can feel it. We're just ready. We're positioned. I know God is about to pour out his spirit upon all flesh like we've never seen before. I know and believe it. This is not just a statement, but I've got a faith in my heart that I'm going to be a part of that. And I'm going to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to see people baptized in Jesus' name. As a matter of fact, pastor, my pastor just got up and preached. He just preached on baptism. He just, all he did was preach on Jesus' name, baptism. And I began to rejoice and four people got baptized last Sunday in our church. Why? Because that doctrine will never get old. Apostolic doctrine will never get old. Hearing, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, will never get old. And you better believe we're going to preach and we're going to see it no matter what the devil has to say or what the world has to say. We're going to see it in Jesus' name. I said, I can feel the excitement in my spirit. I know what God's about to do. I know what God is about to do. I know what he's about to do. (laughs) And I'm going to be a part of it in the name of Jesus. Oh, but if we're not careful. In our quest for the harvest and in our pursuit for the things that we may have lost years ago and in our excitement, for what God has in store, we may forget a lesson in 2020. If we're not careful, we can forget the thing that God offered us in 2020. We could forget that deeper, intimate walk with God. <laughs> and he offered to us a time of worship. He offered to us a time of intimate worship with him. He offered to us a time of just being at his feet and just hearing the word of God. He offered to us putting worshiping in that time above the work of God. Oh, I said that he stopped the access to the work so that we would have greater access to worship. I said in that time, he stopped all the services. He stopped the nursing home services. He stopped the jail services. He stopped all the youth class. He stopped all those things. He said, I'm shutting it down. I'm shutting down all the works, but I'm giving you a greater access to worship. And in that time, oh, did I grow. I know for me, I can only speak for me, but I know that I was touching God and that I was sitting at his feet and just learning of him. But if we're not careful, because we're in the flow of things again. We're in the flow of, of the work of God and seeing things happen in the kingdom of God that we can forget this lesson. And I'm not talking about praise. I'm talking about worship. I'm not talking about thanking him for what he's done because anybody can do that. I'm talking about worshiping for who he is. I'm talking about a revelation that's been given to you about who he is because I know for me that he's my provider. I know for me that he's my savior. I know for me that he's my deliverer because he's revealed it to me. I said, anybody can praise God. I said, even sinners can praise God. Anybody outside the church can praise God. And they do it. They say, thank God and thank you, Jesus. And I agree with them. I say, hey, you're right. Praise the Lord. Don't say thank you, Jesus, around me. I agree with you and say, do you know him? But anybody can praise the Lord. Anybody can clap their hands and shout a little bit for what he's done. But it's a whole nother depth. It's a whole nother level when you begin to worship him for his character. When you begin to worship him for who he is. Ha! When you begin to worship and say, you know what, Lord? Doesn't matter what I'm going through. I know that you're still God. I know that you're the one true living God. I know that you are the one who... I know that you're the one who set the captives free. I know that you're the one. You are my deliverer, Jesus. You are my savior, Jesus. You are my healer, Jesus. I said, I want to worship him for who he is. I said, it's so easy. It's real easy to praise him. But oh, worship takes you to a whole nother dimension. Worship brings you to a whole nother nother realm because worship is built on intimacy. People who truly worship know him by revelation. That revelation comes from relationship. 
a true relationship, spending time with Jesus. To sit at the feet of someone, it demonstrates the intimate relationship between a person and the other person who sits at their feet. This was demonstrated often by rabbis and their disciples. And every day, they're at the feet of their rabbi. The rabbi is talking and the disciples listening. And he's talking back with the rabbi. And he's doing whatever the rabbi asks of him. And that student wants to learn everything that rabbi has to offer. And at some point even, you would dare say, they want to become like that rabbi. And they are to become so acquainted with that rabbi that in turn they may offer their services to the community and to the synagogue. Oftentimes, though, those disciples, like the disciples of Jesus, those students, they felt like they were already ready. They were too ready for action as opposed to just sitting at his feet. And herein lies our issue, church. We often, oftentimes are so busy being his feet instead of being at his feet. I said oftentimes we're all so busy being his feet that we're not spending as much time being at his feet. And I know where I'm preaching. I know my audience. Undoubtedly, this church has affected millions, billions, I dare say. This church is a, undoubtedly, you're probably a good saint of God, and you're serving in ministry, and you're doing whatever you can to see and push the promotion of the kingdom of God. And I thank God for it. And in fact, I'm not knocking that at all, but I just feel the beckoning of the Holy Ghost. I feel the call of the Holy Ghost this year saying, hey, you better, whoa, you better hold up a little bit, son. You need to hold up a little bit, son before you get to going and chasing into that harvest, you need to be chasing my heart. <laughs> we become, oh, forgive me, it's just a burden in my spirit. We are more acquainted with the work of the harvest than the Lord himself of the harvest. We spend more time in the work of the Lord than to spend time with the Lord himself. We are often mingled in those places where he's given us and told us to go, the highways and the byways where we're not even in our closet. <laughs> we're not in our closet like we need to be. God is looking for worshipers. God is searching, the Bible says, for worshipers. The Bible doesn't say he's looking for workers. No, the Bible doesn't say he's looking for laborers. He said to pray that they're sent out, but he, that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for worshipers, those who say, you know what, doesn't matter what it takes, doesn't matter what I go through, I'm going to worship him for him, not what he can give me, not what he can give me. I'm going to worship Jesus just for Jesus. I'm going to worship the Lord just for him. I said, I don't want him for what he can do for me. And I thank God for everything he's ever done for me. But you better believe, you better believe if he doesn't do another thing for me, Colin Taylor's going to worship. Colin Taylor's going to the closet. Colin Taylor's going to his feet. And I'm going to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I said, what would you do if he took it all away? Huh? What would you do if he didn't give another thing? What would you do if you didn't have a ministry? What would you do if they didn't ask you to sing? If they didn't ask you to preach? If they didn't ask you to serve? Would you be at his feet? I would to God at the end of this. Oh, Lord, have mercy. At the end of this, this wouldn't be a prayer room, but a throne room, but that we would just worship the Lord and just magnify him and just, and just make it all about him, not about the souls, okay? And, and he's concerned about it, but just an allotted time to worship him. God is looking for lovers first before laborers. God is looking for intimacy first before intercession. God is looking for worshipers first before workers. God is looking and searching for those who seek his heart first before the harvest. 
Matthew 7, 22. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Can you imagine a day <laughs> when they say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and done all these many wonderful works. And those works were needed. Those works are needed. We've got to see souls saved. <laughs> We've got to see miracle signs and wonders. We've got to see the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. We've got to see those things. We've got to see devils cast out. We need deliverance, but you better believe before all that, God is looking for a worshiper. <laughs> and when these men try to go to Jesus <laughs> and they're looking to their works, as validation to get into heaven, Jesus turns to them and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. It doesn't take 30 minutes to search out the word new. But that word is more than just an intellectual knowledge. It is an acquaintance. It's intimately knowing the person. That's me knowing God and God knowing me because we know about Jesus. We can quote his word. We can quote his stories. We can read the epistles. We can read the stories of the Bible. And we can tell those stories to other people. And we can put it on a table in a home Bible study. And we can tell other people about it. But the question is, the real question that we should be seeking after is, do we know him? And much rather, are we known of him? Not everybody. Who seeks Jesus wants him for him. The scribes, they sought Jesus because they wanted answers to their questions. The Sadducees sought Jesus because they wanted their tradition justified. The Pharisees sought Jesus because they wanted to twist his words. Men and women sought Jesus, even took a boat to the other side just to get loaves and fish. Even the woman with the issue of blood, whom we we preach and thank God for that story, incredible story of faith. But even that scripture testifies that she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, even she was just searching for a need. But there's a man in Luke chapter 19, the Bible says, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. Zacchaeus was scrambling. He was short. He couldn't see Jesus because of the press, the Bible says. He was little of stature. But this man, he said, I don't want anything from this man. I don't, if he doesn't give me anything, cool. If he gives me something, that's great. But the Bible says that he went to see who he was. He went to see who Jesus was. And the Bible says in verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. He saw Zacchaeus. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down for today. I must abide at thy house. It was a priority for Jesus when he saw the heart of a worshiper like that. Not seeking for something out of his hand, but he was seeking the face of Jesus. And he said, I've got to go to your house. Zacchaeus, whether he knew it or not, he had a heart of a worshiper. He was seeking Jesus for who he was. He wanted to know exactly who this Jesus was. And because of that, Jesus said, I'm going to your house. I'm going to your house. I'm going to your house. Let me tell you something. There's a type of worship. There's a sincere, pure worship that says it's going to be more than what I bring to the house of God. But it's a worship that says I'm inviting Jesus to my house. Is your worship fervent enough? Is your sincere, pure worship fervent enough to bring Jesus home with you? Is it powerful enough for Jesus to say I'm coming home with you? I'm not just going to leave my worship in the house of God. I'm not just going to leave what I normally do in the house of God, but I'm taking it to my closet. I'm taking it to my house. And when I get there, I'm going to his feet and I'm going to worship Worship him. <laughs> I 
I said, is he invited to your house? Is your worship inviting to your house? God will come to us. God will come to us for us. That is the intimate things. God will come to us for us when we go to him for him. He will come to us for who we are if we go to him for who he is. Even in the midst of a crowd, it was a press, the Bible says. And the Bible talks about the press many times, how people, it was literally like you cannot get through. There isn't like, it's not like an apostolic altar call where you kind of just, just tap somebody, move them to the side, kind of slide. That, that, that's not how that was. It was a press. You could not get through. And so Zacchaeus, his worship drove him to a tree. He said, I've got to see Jesus. And out of all the people, Zacchaeus got his attention. Zacchaeus got his attention. But if all we want is an answer, we can have it. If all you want is your need met, you can have it. If all you want is bread, you can have it. If all you want is a fish, you can have it. If all you want is for him to meet that need, you can have it. Oh, but with that, you'll never get him. With that, you'll never get the fullness. With that, you'll never get his character. But when you seek him for him, we'll get all those things in the overflow. If we seek him for him, we'll get everything that's on our mind. All those things that are on our mind, the needs, we'll get them when we seek him for him. Oh, it's time to seek him for him, church. When's the last time that you went to your closet or even in a church service, and you said, I, I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm just here to worship. I'm just here to worship you, Jesus. I'm just here to magnify you. I'm just here for you. I'm not here, and you know my need, but I'm not here for that. I'm just here to worship. But when we seek him, we'll get all of that that's on our mind. That's in our spirit. It's time to seek him again. One thing I understand about God, I may have revelation, but there's always more. Oh, there's always more. He can always just just peel back that layer and say, let me show you another thing. He can always peel that back and say, let me show you another thing. There's always more. John chapter 12, the Bible says with Mary, she took this pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. We know this was a year's wages. She anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. She was just in another place in worship. You ever see those people who, you can walk by them, you can maybe even call their name. They're just in another, they're in a whole nother realm. They're in the third heaven. They, they just, ain't no, I know some people like that. I'm like, don't even bother them. They're going to come out in Jesus' name. But she was in a whole nother place. Oh, a whole nother place. It filled the house. That odor filled the house. She didn't care about what everybody else had to say. She wasn't worried about what those people were going to say. And sure enough, somebody said something. Sure enough, somebody said something. Mr. Judas which the Bible says, which should betray him. He said, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? It was that voice of ministry calling. I'm talking to some ministers. I'm talking to musicians. I'm talking to Sunday school teachers, youth teachers. You better hear this. There will always be a voice of ministry calling. There will always be a voice of serving calling. But do not let the enemy nor your flesh talk you out of worship from his feet. Do not let that voice, do not let that voice of ministry, and we're going to do ministry. Colin Taylor believes in ministry. If not, I wouldn't be here. But do not let that voice of ministry talk you out of worship. Before you do the work of the Lord. 
There will always be a need calling your name. There will always be something to do. There will always be something in your mind, but you've got to resist that temptation. You say, you know what? I'm not being his feet until I get to his feet. I'm not going to be his feet until I know that I've been at his feet. I'm not going to get on my feet until I've been at his feet. you got to resist that temptation and say, you know what? I'm going to be a lover. I'm going to be a lover today before I'm a laborer. I'm going to get intimate before I intercede because God has to, to supply the strength for it. I want to be a worshiper before a worker. This same Mary poured it out on the feet of Jesus. Was again mentioned at the feet of Jesus. Luke chapter 10, the Bible says, Now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received them into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also what? Sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving. And it's possible to have Jesus in your house and miss the opportunity to worship. I said it's possible for Jesus to be right next to you, and you, cannot, you can just simply forget about him because of the cares of life. Listen, Colin Taylor knows about the cares of life. I know what it's like being under the pressure. I know what it's like when people are calling your phone 12 o'clock in the morning asking, asking just questions that could wait. But listen, I say, you know what? It's that good old do not disturb. And it's more, just not, more than just not, don't disturb me. No, you're not going to disturb my devotion. You're not going to disturb what I've got going on between me and Jesus. And so that question can wait for a little bit, but I've got to get in because it's possible to miss it when he's right next to you. And of course, Martha, she says, Lord, do, do you not care that my sister have left me to serve alone? She's looking around looking at people, and miss Jesus. She missed Jesus. She said, tell her to help me. The equivalent today is, Lord, I pray you touch sister so-and-so. Just, I see her worshiping and praying. Just move on her so that we can put up these chairs. <laughs> I, know the, I know it's a powerful move of God, but we got chairs to put up, Okay. But then Jesus answers back. She says, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. In other words, he said, I'm not going to ask her. You're just going to either have to do what she does or you have to continue where you're at. I'm not going to ask her. Her answer it wasn't found in his hand. It was found at his feet. It was found at his feet. The word didn't come when Mary was walking about. No, the word came when she was at his feet. The word came, the answer came when she was at the feet of God. She was at feet of Jesus. And your answer may not come seeking the face of God. Your answer may not come seeking the hand of God. Your answer may not come seeking the mind of God. But your answer can probably come at the feet of Jesus. Because I know that the answer will come, and I've just learned this. The answer will come when the answer doesn't matter anymore. I said, when the answer just doesn't matter anymore, and I'm just caught up with him, when the only thing that matters is him, the only thing that matters is, is who he is, that's when the answer comes. That's when the wisdom comes. That's when the counsel comes. That's when the knowledge comes. That's when the provision comes. That's when the healing comes. Because it's not about what he can give me. It's about who he is. It's time to go back to his feet. Ugh. A couple years ago, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. <laughs> I thought I was just, I just thought I was, I don't know, somebody important. The Lord spoke to me. He said, you're not doing anything this summer. You're going to go home and you're going to sit. I don't want you to say anything. Not a word. He said, if anybody asks you to preach or teach, you're not going. You're not going. I said, 
okay. He said, whatever your pastor asks you to do, you can do it. But you're not going to camp. You're not going to NAYC. You're not doing other stuff. You're going to sit. And I said, okay, Lord. And at the time as well, I was going through anxiety. I was dealing with anxiety and panic attacks. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, I'm going to teach you how to, how to hear my voice and how to discipline your thoughts. So what I need from you right now is to not say anything. And the Lord told me to sit. And I call, I call that summer the summer of sitting because can I tell you, can I tell you that was the most impactful summer. I heard the voice of God. I was hearing God's voice. I was discerning my thoughts. I was declaring over my mind peace above the anxiety. And God was speaking to me, and he was directing me. He was teaching me, and yes, I was getting rebuked. You better believe it. I was getting chastened, and he was telling me just like it is. He was telling me all these things. You said you got pride, and you got arrogance, and that stuff needs to get out, and you're not going to do anything great if you've got that in you. And he just began to just shake me. But, oh, that summer of sitting, that summer when I was hearing his word like Mary, that summer where I was like, oh, God, where I would literally roll out of bed. Not even a thank you, Jesus. I would roll out of bed and just, just speak, Lord. I'm here. Oh, can I tell you, that summer of sitting, Colin Taylor wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I know without a doubt if I didn't sit before God, if I didn't sit before God and allow him to speak and allow him to deal with me, I know for a fact that I wouldn't be here. But I thank God for that summer because it's not about, sometimes it's just not about what he can do for you. Sometimes it's not about what he can give. It's just about who he is. He just wants us to sit at his feet. He just wants us to worship him for who he is. Matthew 26, this, this old St. Mary, the Bible keeps mentioning, and I'm almost done. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, this that woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Heaven gave her an everlasting eulogy. A eulogy that will last forever. It's in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. It's eternal. Heaven gave her an everlasting eulogy. They said, so long as this gospel is preached, it will be preached. This story will be talked about. This will be her testimony. Oftentimes, eulogies have multiple acts of a person, but for her, she only had one eulogy. She only had one thing that was on that piece of paper, so to speak, for that eulogy, for that preacher to read. And it said that she broke open that alabaster box. She sat at the feet of Jesus and she worshiped him. That is the eulogy that she had. My wife and I, we, we've already been at two memorials, memorial services this year. Both on opposite ends of the spectrum, so to speak. If you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. But God, he, I was in the eulogy, uh, memorial service, this lady my, in a church my wife grew up in, <laughs> Abigail would tell me, she would just come and just pray. She was a prayer warrior. And she would just pray. And she could pray people through to the Holy Ghost. And, and I didn't know the lady. Honestly, I was just a chauffeur. I just wanted to take my wife, her mom, her dad. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just here. I'm, thank God, I'm in the house of God. I want to worship the Lord. We're going to honor this lady. That's cool. Oh, I don't know this lady, but oh, they didn't have to testify of her. And they did. They got up and testified of her, but they didn't have to. Because what I felt... <laughs> was the glory of God descending in that sanctuary. And I knew that, oh, this is a woman of God. This is somebody that heaven knows. This is somebody that, this is somebody who has had impact on heaven. And I began to think, oh God, Colin, what will heaven's eulogy be for you? If you were to go today, what would be the eulogy that heaven has for you? 
Will it be that you are a worshiper? Will it be that you are a man of God? Will it be that you are a prayer warrior? What will heaven testify of you? And you better believe, oh, I would just lift my hands in that service. And I felt the glory of God. I felt angels surrounding that lady. Why? Because she had a walk with God. She was a worshiper. She was somebody who got heaven's attention. <laughs> what memorial will be penned on the paper of heaven's scroll for you? I told the Lord, I don't, don't put Colin Taylor was a good preacher because I'm barely that, not even that. Don't put that I served X amount of hours. Don't put that I did all these things. Don't put that. But if you want to put something, put that I was a worshiper. Put that I was somebody who got on your feet and was at your feet and was worshiping. Oh, God. I hope that the bird is communicating to you right now. <laughs> What will your memorial be? Oh, God. What will your eulogy be? What will heaven testify of you? What will it be? Because let me tell you something. It's not going to be of all the hours you worked in this church and thank God for it. It's not going to be of all the things you done for the Lord and thank God for it. It's going to be about who you are. It's going to be about who you are. Did you worship him? Do you know him? Are you known of him? That's what's going to be the testimony. Let's stand tonight. Oh, just a couple more scriptures. Just a couple more scriptures. I'll give you instruction in a moment. I feel the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 2, the Bible says, talking about the wise men, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, talking about Jesus. The Bible says they fell down and worshipped him. I want you to just notice something real quick. The, uh, uh, the things that happened after they worshipped, the Bible says, after they worshipped, they opened their treasures. They presented unto him gifts, gold frankincense and myrrh. Gold is oftentimes representative of the divine presence of God. You see this with the Ark of the Covenant. It was made of wood, but it was overlaid with gold. That represented the incarnation of Jesus Christ because he was a man, fully man and fully God, but he was present with us. The Bible says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That literally means he was tabernacle with us. It was that gold was representative of the divine presence. And then frankincense was, was brought. That represents the perfume of the worship and prayer. And even the Jews connected that frankincense perfume that was pure white. It was pure. When, whenever they would uh, cut it out of the tree, it would just ooze. It would be a pure white. And they would mix it in, mix in it with all the other oils and all the other spices to make this perfume. It was pure. It was so pure. And then the Bible says that they brought myrrh. Myrrh was an antiseptic. In other words, they used that to heal open wounds. They used that, they used that to heal wounds that were open and so that they can prevent it from it being infected. They even offered myrrh to Jesus while he was on the cross. Because when pure worship flows, God will open up treasures. I've seen it in my life. I've seen when, it, when it's just all about him, the glory of God will fall. The glory of God is going to fall in this place. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place so strong. I can feel the worshiping angels with us. I thank God for the ministering angels. I thank God for those angels that war on our behalf. But oh, when you're with worshiping angels, it is just another experience. I felt it for myself. Hallelujah. And then there's that myrrh. I'm trying to tell you, God, if you are here today, I'm talking to you, minister. I'm talking to you, a, a servant of God, saint of God. Tonight, it's time to take off that armor of God. I know that we're always in the fight. We're always fighting for our church and our pastor, and you ought to continue to fight for your church and your pastor. But there's just sometimes you got to take off that armor. You've got to take off that armor, lay that armor down, and let the presence of the Lord just come and just take you in. Just let him come and just sweep you in, and just let him love on you a little bit. Mm. I feel real impressed on that point. Let me just share a story. <clears throat> the guy I was, uh, I was praying one time. I was 
It was actually in that same time where the Lord told me to sit. But God gave me a vision when I was praying. He showed me a Roman helmet on my head, but on the Roman helmet, it was this big gash. It was like somebody took a sword and just was continuously hitting it across my head. And even God was allowing me to feel impressions on my head like that, like that was happening. The Lord spoke to me. He said, because you refuse to take off your armor in my presence, I wasn't able to restore it and refine it. You have got to have time. There's time of warfare, but there's time of worship. There's time where you've got to lay it all down and say, here I am, Jesus. Not the warrior, <laughs> but the worshiper. Not the warrior, but the worshiper. That myrrh, God is able to heal. God wants to do some emotional healing. And all the times God has got into the deep places. You know, the, the true definition of intimacy is to expose the secret parts. God wants to expose our hearts oftentimes. And we've got to come to his presence and say, you know what? I'm going to expose my heart to you. Expose my scars. Jesus did this already, though. John chapter 20, the Bible says, when Thomas was doubting, he said, I'm not going to believe until I see those scars. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus didn't have to do it, but he said, here, look at my scars. Look at the scars I've already done for you. You can believe I'm talking to somebody don't know who it is, but you've got scars, you've got wounds. God wants to heal it tonight in the name of Jesus. When you begin to worship and just worship him, he's going to pour out that restoration. He's going to pour it out. Hallelujah. When pure worship flows, the treasures of God will open. The Bible says in verse 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Can I tell you that after they worshiped, they got their answer? Can I also tell you that they weren't even seeking for that answer? It just came. The answer just came. The answer just came after worship. Mm. Let's lift our hands for a moment. Before we make an altar call, let's... Let's prepare our hearts for a moment. Oh, Jesus. Right now, I'm asking you spiritually, why don't you take off that armor? Why don't you begin to prepare yourself to enter into the presence of the Lord like never before? Hallelujah. <laughs> come on, come on, just talk to him just real quick. Just let him know. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hear me for a moment. I'm going to invite you to this altar, but before you come, come with the determination. Come with the determination. It's not about the answers I need. <laughs> It's not about what, I, what, what you can do for me, Jesus. It's not about any of that. When you come to this altar, come to this altar for him. And I would beckon you, if you're physically able, especially young people, you ought to get on your face. You've got to get a revelation of God. <laughs> You've got to get a revelation that will never shake you out the church. <laughs> You've got to make up in your mind and say, you know what? I'm not here for blessing. I'm not here for any other of healing. And I know that you could do it. But God, I'm here for you and just you alone. Come on. That's it. That's beautiful. Come. That's it. Make room. Make room. Come on. As I said before, let it not be a prayer room. Let's just make this a throne room. Come on. You can only worship God based on the revelation that you have of him. But tonight, God's about to reveal more parts of him that you, than you've ever understood. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's it. Come on, worship him. It may feel awkward, but worship him for him. Just saying, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, I worship you, God. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Come on, don't let this moment pass you by. 
Don't let this moment pass you by. Don't let this moment pass you by. (laughs) You've got to say, I want to know you, Jesus. I want to know you, Jesus. I want to know you. (laughs) Iyodoro na 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 ba kaya na 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 ba shatai. 